Hello, this is Anthony David Hobbs, and I'm sorry the lighting is a bit awkward. In fact, at one point I thought, do this tomorrow when it's daylight again. But then I thought, no, you can't do this, you, have to, you can't do that, because you have to say this today, it has to be today. Anyway, I want to talk about Bastille Day, or French Revolution Day as I sometimes call it. Because today is the 14th of July. Bastille Day, the day the French peasants revolted and stormed the Bastille. And it's 225 years ago to the day. So something's always a big deal when it's 25 years old, so I figured, you know, it's 225th anniversary. And um, what can I say about the French Revolution? Well, it's it's always been important, but I suppose it's very special now because it was two, the 225th anniversary. And the first time I learned about the French Revolution, when I knew that, that phrase, French Revolution, but I didn't know what it meant, you know, I'd heard of it, but I didn't know much about it. Um, but when I knew and understood what it was about, that's when I was almost 13, so learning about it at school, and uh, the French rebelled, you know, the storming of the Bastille. And I'll never forget that feeling it gave me inside, the idea that you don't have to obey your master, you don't have to obey your leaders, you know. If they if they go out of line, if they oppress you too much, you can turn against them. And it was just so strange, because before that point, I'd always been taught, you know, your elders, your betters, they know best, and you obey anything they say without question. So, yes, it, um, it gave me a very, you know, quite an emotional feeling inside, you know. And then I thought, why don't I rebel, you know? <laughs> I'm almost 13, I'll be a rebel, I'll rebel against the school. And, and the, But then I thought, well, no, I'm... I'm relatively happy with the way things are going at the moment. But if things did get too outrageous, if I was oppressed too much, then yes, I'd rebel against them, yeah. In other words, you don't obey a leader no matter what. You obey your leader if he gives you what you want, you know. <laughs> a leader, people have to do as he says, or as she says. But it works the other way around. You've got to give the people what they want, and if you do, they won't rebel against you. It's, it's that simple. And um, the French peasants didn't even have enough money to eat properly. You know, they were dying of starvation. And one of the rebels said, We must rebel. What have we got to lose? Nothing. Which, which, which yeah, makes perfect sense, yeah. You just can't possibly live like this anymore. And the tax system, they'd always had heavy taxes, but not like this on this kind of scale. But apparently Louis the Sixteenth wasn't a total tyrant. I mean, yes, he did live in obscene luxury while they were dying of starvation, but... It's because all the, not, not just the royal family, but the rich landowners, the, the, the already incredibly rich, wanted to get even richer. So there was this new idea that the rich never pay any taxes, <laughs> which is totally ridiculous. It's not like they can't afford taxes, but um, no, they wanted to not pay any taxes to get even richer. So where's all the money going to come from? It comes from the already incredibly poor. So the whole thing was fixed, so the rich stay rich and the... Uh, no, no. The whole thing's fixed, so the poor stay poor and the rich stay rich. And um, But Louis the Sixteenth, he did try and persuade, you know, he did say to these rich landers, for, for goodness sake, you know, you've got to pay some tax. You know, I, you can't expect me to, you know, drain every single penny out of these poor. They're already incredibly poor, but that they wouldn't obey him. And he was a bit too squeamish and silly to... He just did what he could to, to please them, you know. And, of course... The American Revolution, a lot of that was funded by the French. I'll be brutally honest, I don't think the French particularly liked the Americans, no. They just did it to, to spite the British, yeah, because the French hated the British at the time. So they figured, if we if we hurt, if we help the Americans, that will hurt the British, and that sounds good to us. Yeah, the, England and France have had more wars together than any other nations, you know. We're friends now, I'm pleased to say, but yes, the English and French have... Never seen eye to eye for many centuries. And um, well, what can I say about revolution in general? Well, in the late 18th century, revolution was in the air, yes. The American Revolution, the French Revolution, and a different kind of revolution, what they call the Age of Reason, which was also going on in the 18th century. And, um, well, basically what that is, um, it's when people stopped believing in magic and ghosts and gods and goddesses. They started to believe in science, you know, uh, because science seemed more logical and more believable than religion and magic, you know. I mean, obviously this didn't happen overnight, but it started to take a big turn in a big way in the late 18th century. You know, the scientists were 
overruling the philosophies of magicians, you know. So people are starting to believe in science more than what they used to believe in magic. Yeah. And is revolution a good thing? Well, yes and no. You know, if you want to rebel against the government or anything else, you ha you can only do it with good reason. You know, you can't rebel for a laugh. You have to have a justifiable reason. You you know, you, are you genuinely oppressed and you can't take any more? And also, the French, they got rid of King Louis, you know, after four years, or almost four years, of he um, he promised to, you know, make a fairer system, you know, we're going to have a change, you know, but it turned out he was lying with them all along, and uh, he was conspiring with other countries to get his throne back and put the tax system back the way it was before they rebelled. And as you may imagine, the revolutionaries were infuriated at this and uh, had him beheaded. But who did they have as leader after him? You know, it was just, it was all chaos, you know, there was no leader, there was all this dispute over who the leader should be, and it was absolute chaos, you know, and it was a horrendous, harsh system, these new revolutionaries ruled, and they, they said everyone was equal, they called each other citizen, you know, everyone's equal, but equal is a loose term, because, you know, the revolutionaries, the ones that ruled, they had power over life and death, and anyone that didn't support the re revolution could just be killed, just like that, you know, in a split second. No trial, nothing. Anyone who dared to even say anything <laughs> that the revolution was wrong was killed, just like that, instant death. So it was, yeah, it was pretty horrendous stuff, you know. And also, of course, the the aristocrats were all killed, you know, beheaded. Anyone that looked rich was had to be killed. Because the belief was you weren't against, you're against the revolution, you're rich, you must be against it. But no, I don't think all of them were against it. I think some of them, uh, they were just doing as they were told by the king, you know. They didn't really, you know. In other words, when you get rid of a bad leader, that's a good thing. But you have to have a good leader to replace him. It's, you have to have a backup plan. But the French revolutionaries, they didn't think past getting rid of the king, you know, so... If you want a big change, you have to think of the consequences. You have to have a suitable leader to replace the bad leader way in advance. You can't just get rid of him and hope a new one will come. Oh, they had a, a very different kind of leader, yes. Um, years later, Napoleon took over. And that, yes, that caused all kinds of chaotic problems, yeah. So, in other words, revolution is good if, um, if, a le if you get a much better leader to replace the bad one. And, oh yes, I remember learning about Bastille Day, although it's called the Bastille Day, the storming of the Bastille. It, that phrase, storming of the Bastille, sort of implies they smashed and destroyed the Bastille. They didn't. The authority figures in the Bastille um, gave up, surrendered, and let them, you, you can have it, you can take the Bastille, and didn't try and stop them anymore. So, yes. But you see, the thing you have to understand is that the Bastille was a very famous building at the time, and it represented the power of the king and, and, you know, and the cruel tyranny, the horrible consequences for any criminals, you know. And it, 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 they thought, well, it represents the power of our enemy, the king, so let's destroy it, you know. So, yes, it's, it's symbolic, them destroying the Bastille. And um, it's not there anymore, but, there, but the site, the, the place where it used to be, is a popular place for, like, student rebels who want to, you know, sort of... Or, or political activists who want want a big change. If you want a big change and do it in a famous location, you do it where the Bastille used to be. And I wanted to see the place where it used to be when I went to France, but I was advised not to because it might be dangerous. There's political rebels, or it, people might get hurt in the process during their demonstration, their rally. So, so I decided not to go to it. Okay, so um. Yes, the ordinary people are important, power to the people and all that, but you have to have a leader, you know. A bad leader is a bad thing, but no leader at all, that's even worse, because then it's just chaos, nobody obeys anyone. So, yes, the answer is have a good leader that gives the people what they want. Okay, well, if there's any French people out there watching this at the moment, then happy Bastille Day.